pleasure to introduce Dr. Jason Nerds. He's a senior lecturer in cybersecurity at the University of Kent. He's a visiting academic at the University of Oxford and an associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. His research explores the interdisciplinary nature of cybersecurity, privacy, and trust. This specially considers the impact of new technologies on these areas. As a result of this broad remit, Dr. Nerds has had the pleasure of working across various domains, including cybersecurity, socio-technical security, and privacy, cyber psychology, and computational social science. Uh, Jason has authored over 100 peer-reviewed articles in venues such as the Journal of Cybersecurity, Computer and Security, ACM Chi Conference uh, on Human Factors in Computing System, IEEE IT Professional, and Computers in Human Behavior. He regularly speaks on cybersecurity in mainstream media, including the Wall Street Journal, the BBC, and BBC Radio 4, Newsweek, Wired, Info Security Magazine, Threat Post, The Register, Naked Security, Tech Radar, and The Conversation. Over to you, Jason. Oh, by the way, and the title of the talk is a framework for effective corporate communication after cybersecurity incidents. Over to you, Jason. Uh, thank you very much, Sanjay. Um, can I just confirm that you can see my screen? You can see me. Yes. Can you see me? Yeah. Sorry. Great. And you can hopefully still see me. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Well, thanks again for the for the introduction, and thanks to everyone who who has uh, joined today. So. Um, Today, as Sanjay mentioned, uh, my talk is a framework for effective corporate communications after cybersecurity incidents. And this is a bit of work that I've wanted to do for, for a very, very long time. And I was, I was kind of quite happy to have the opportunity to, to do it and publish on it uh, late last year. And this is kind of what my talk is essentially going to be structured around. For those of you that are, are interested in kind of having a bird's eye view of, of what I'm going to talk about today, and actually to maybe do some even on, maybe even if you want to do some kind of reading on the site or just to check what, what it's about and to see the kind of full research article, you can see it kind of on screen here um, in that you can basically Google, you know, a the, basically the title of this talk. Uh, it was published in Computers and Security uh, late last year, I think, yeah, in September last year. There's a DOI, there's a DOI for, you, for you to use and also now uh, the archive uh, preprint. And what I've also done in the context of this work and the, and the aim of this work being directed not only towards academics, uh, but also really towards industry, I've also created a kind of a two page or a white paper, uh, which you can also get uh, from my GitHub page. So without further ado, let's jump into the kind of reason why we're all here today. So some of you might be familiar with this with this quote. If you're not, I do kind of strongly suggest it. It's a really interesting one. It's one I kind of use in, in even my kind of lectures and, and my talks more generally. And as you can see here, it's Robert Mueller, former director of the FBI. And the, the quote is, you know, I'm convinced that there are only two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that will be. And then it, it goes on. But the crux of what I want to get to here is that there's a reality that as we kind of advance in cybersecurity as we advance as a society. One of the realities is that attacks will happen and attacks um, will continue to happen. And the, there is not a, oh, you know, let's prepare for never, ever, ever getting breached. It's really a case of preparing for not only the breach, but preparing to what do you do after the breach actually occurs. And let's jump to some examples quickly. And this is really when I think in October 2015 is when we really want to start doing this bit of this bit of research. And if you kind of cast your minds back to some of you that might be familiar with this incident, um, or those of you that, that aren't, I'll, I'll introduce it now. So on the 23rd of October, 2015, uh, the TalkTalk Talk CEO basically had a report to, to kind of make this comment. I can't, so there was a breach of TalkTalk, Talk, which is an internet service provider uh, in the UK. And the comment was from the TalkTalk Talk CEO was, I can't confirm that customer's data was encrypted. So TalkTalk Talk had a breach. And, and the CEO was, was engaging with the media uh, quite a lot, actually. And the first one, the key quotes that came out of that was, I can't confirm that data was encrypted. And, you know, even in 2015, there was this big thing, well, why wasn't data encrypted? And how can you not know that data was encrypted? And then, and then this comment that basically kind of said, you know, we are taking that very, very seriously in terms of the risk to customers. So that really, of course, is an interesting thing. 
And what that kicked off actually is a real kind of back, a significant backlash from people, uh, from customers that may have been impacted. So as you see here, and I apologize for the quality of this, um, this kind of Twitter thread, uh, it was a, quite a while ago. You can see here this individual really being quite disgusted. Um, as you can see here, you know, a bit disgusted to read about this in the paper, why wasn't I contacted um, putting in a privately about this as a first priority. And what this and the other examples that I'll, I'll show you kind of get to the point of is this really difficulty of when a business is breached, who do they contact, when do they contact them, how do they kind of engage with stakeholders, not only customers and so on. And there's not only one example of that. Another example here you can see um, is the Equifax breach. So this is interesting for a number of uh, reasons, but not only the, the breach itself, but as you can see here, um, you know, the fact that Equifax actually used a separate domain um, for uh, a separate domain name to actually report that the breach had occurred. Uh, so, so people could actually try to engage. So that was interesting because instead of having their own, their usual domain name and maybe having uh, a subdomain off of that related to the breach, no, they had a different domain completely, which was actually flagged as a phishing by some actual browsers. And then on their official Twitter page, they actually tweeted the wrong link um, to, to the kind of place where you can go and report and find out more. And it's really kind of highlights this question of, well, you know, are companies paying enough attention to the communication piece? And then of course, as you can see here in the middle, it took them six weeks to actually disclose the attack. So that was a while ago. And once again, there's this just last bit here. One, another really interesting thing that I found, this is from uh, Crypto Security. You know, if you access the, the website from your phone, you might say it was not impacted, you were not impacted by the breach. But if you, you access the same website with the same data from your laptop, you could actually find it might say that you may have been impacted. Once again, is well, how, how is this, what, what's going on here? Why is this not uh, addressed? And then TravelX being another example, um, some of you might be very familiar with TravelX. For them, the key thing there is that it took 17 days after the cyber attack had occurred for them to actually publicly respond. So the crux of the, the, the real question really that this research, my research tried to focus on is what does effective corporate communication uh, on PR look like after an incident? So, the, and one of the key things here trying to get at is not the kind of technical incident response, not the digital forensics. How do you speak to people? What do you say as an organization? How do you say it? How do you engage? What's the good thing to say? What's bad to say? That's what this research actually tries to get to the bottom of. So the way how we, we approach this problem um, is that we looked into, and I should say, actually, when I say we, um, this work was done by um, one of my master students and myself. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about. And you can find, of course, the author's information on the, on the um, publication. So we approach this problem in a number, it kind of uses a number of different kind of uh, uh, stages. The first stage was actually a systematic literature review. Um, and the point here was to try to understand what was the academic best practice when it comes to what should companies say after a breach has occurred. And then we also try to analyze a number of real world cases. Um, our real world cases, of course, give us the, the real world nature. So, you know, some people might complain, especially in industry, when I, when we, when I engage with industry with people on this problem, the, the key thing was, well, what you're doing seems all academic. You know, how do I, how do we know this is going to work in industry? So what we did was we looked into kind of a number of real world cases as well. Um, we try to ex expand, uh, explore them and investigate them to try to understand what does industry best practice look like? And then from that, that gave us kind of an idea of what is academic best practice and what is industry best practice. And then we could kind of combine these, and evaluate and contrast them to try to identify what does real best practice look like? And then what we did was we developed an uh, initial framework to, to help businesses and to help even academics think about this problem of corporate communication. And then we went through a, a number of stages of refining that framework. And that's what I'm gonna go through in a bit more detail uh, now before I actually introduce the framework itself. So first, the systematic literature review. So this, you know, for some, for some of you out there, um, especially some of you that are kind of pure computer scientists, think of this very much as a kind of a state of the art, so SOK paper. Uh, or SOK part of research, uh, systemization, systemization, systemization of knowledge um, um, research. So what the, the aim was here was to basically reflect on a number of kind of key places where research might have been published on this topic of communication and actions after a breach. So we looked into, of course, the IEEE, we looked into ACM, uh, DL, we looked into Web of Science, uh, Business Source Complete to try to get the business perspective of things. So I've seen a number of kind of computing articles uh, focus very much on IEEE, Web of Science, Scopus, and so on. But really for us, the key thing was actually get the business side, what the businesses think 
uh, and what, what has been published in the business domain about this problem. In total, we kind of extracted about 3,500 3, articles and we kind of filtered those down to get a core set of 45, but actually related to the problem and helps to identify kind of what best practice might look like in industry towards this problem. And then we basically analyze those using uh, thematic analysis, uh, thematic content analysis, basically a, qual a qualitative content analysis technique to try to identify what are the key themes, what are we seeing here around best practices, what are academics suggesting is things that should or shouldn't be done when it comes to what companies should say after a breach occurs and how they should behave and act. So this, and then from the, the, what, having identified themes, then what we did was we tried to kind of extract a number of kind of key best practices from an academic perspective. So to give you an example of the themes that we identified, it seems one thing that came up was very, very clear is that academics seem to care quite a bit about stock market reaction. So when a breach occurs, what is the impact on the stock market? And a number of academics have tried to do this kind of correlation to kind of, I guess, almost say, you know, the ideal thing is to say, um, attack occurs, data breach occurs, therefore stock market drops. And a lot of academics have tried to look into this correlation and academics have found this correlation. Of course, um, questions around causation and, and kind of length of time are still to be kind of explored and the kind of long-term um, effect. There's a long number of kind of focus, uh, numbers fo them focusing on legal requirements to notify, uh, of course, thinking about laws and regulations. Message framing was also quite key in terms of thinking about how to frame a message. So not, it's not just to say the message as it is, you know, there's a lot of kind of finessing when it comes to a message and what should be said and how it should be said. Um, and then probably I'll focus on negative emotions and kind of the complexity of outsource functions. And that comes in simply because uh, there's been a lot of research looking into supply chains in, in academia, especially kind of cloud computing and so on. Um, and what we found there is that there, because of the interlink of all the organizations today, there's a reality that if a breach in one organization has occurred, that might actually have impacts in other organizations and therefore right to notify, right to engage, right to, right to loop them in to, um, to, to incident response and so on is, is quite important. So from there, we identified a number of kind of key best practices, so things that really should be done. So for instance, um, things like you must demonstrate an, a kind of commitment to stakeholders. You really need to tell stakeholders and show stakeholders that you care, that you, that you, that's, that, you know, this is it. The fact that they have been impacted is important to you and you are gonna try to do something about it. This idea of kind of multi-jurisdictional complexity uh, occurs time and time again. And the fact that, for example, in the US, you know, if a company is breached, they can be impacted. They could have customers impacted across the globe. And each of those customers might have, or not each of them, at least groups of them can have different regulations with respect to how quickly they should be told about the breach and how their data should be responded and how they should be notified and so on. Message framing was another big thing um, that came up in terms of how you should communicate the message. Um, and then lastly, kind of this point about emotional impact in that a lot of breaches just kind of, the way how companies respond is to say, okay, the breach has occurred. Um, what they're going to do is just give you kind of, um, let's say they're going to pay for any impact that you might have or anything or along those kind of lines, or for example, pay for credit monitoring services. Um, but what researchers are trying to say is that there's actually a massive emotional impact of data breaches as well. And that also needs to be considered. So there are a number of kind of um, breach incidents that, that we occurred. Uh, so, so that was the kind of systematic review from the literature, the SOK work. Uh, now let's move to the actual work focused more on analyzing real world cases. And on screen, you can see a number of companies uh, that have been breached over time. What we did in terms of uh, identifying kind of real world cases to focus on, because of course, one big question is, okay, well, Jason, you're looking at real world cases, but how do you select appropriate cases? Because you could, you know, there's infinite amount of data breach cases. How do you select which cases are most important for your, for the context of your study? So the way how we approach this is, we, we thought long and hard about this actually, because this can be considered quite subjective depending on how you approach it. So we decided to actually focus our work a little to, to some extent towards the UK uh, and to basically look at into the UK focused data breaches. And we focused on, we decided to look into the NCSC. So the NCSC releases threat reports every week. And in these threat reports, they basically like cover things such as who has been impacted by a breach, the, the largest breaches, uh, and other bits of information. So what we decided to do was to use that as a key source, not because it's the only source, but because at least it's one, a reputable source, two, 
hopefully quite unbiased, uh, and three, kind of to capture and to reference a number of the key breaches of pact in UK so his, and UK society. So what we did was look at NCSC threat reports. Um, we reviewed references for data breaches. We extracted a number of possible data breaches. We then we focused particularly on UK-centric data breaches. Now, the other thing we want to know is, so let's assume we have this set of data breaches. So that's great. And what we also want to know from an industry perspective is um, what, you know, whether, response, whether companies' response to data breaches was good or bad, what they did good or bad, what they did that could have been improved, what they did that was potentially horrific. So what we did was the NCSC also, in their threat reports, actually make reference on occasion to um, other key third parties. So for example, the NCSC might reference when they're writing up uh, a report on a threat that has you know, impacted the UK or, over a particular week, they might make reference to, okay, well, um, let's say Bruce Schneier commented on this and, and they said this and they show, they, they provide a bit more detail and context of the incident. So in some instances, there are a number of kind of third parties mentioned, there were quite a, quite a few mentioned. And what we assumed, the assumption we made here was that these are clearly experts that the NCSC believes um, is kind of quite critical and, and quite useful and quite, let's say, um, let's say trustworthy, let's say uh, reputable. And what we decided to use, extract those and use those as kind of our kind of expert commentators. So what we then did was we basically took our UK centric data breaches, so took our list of data breaches that we've, we've kind of focused on, and then basically looked at each of the commentators that we had to try to understand what did they say about the data breaches and what did they say in terms of the company's response to the data breach. So for example, if there was a breach on British Airways, uh, we might see that Bruce Schneier or Krebs of Security say, comment and say, here's what the company did right, here's what the company did wrong. Uh, and then we sort of use that expert commentary to then try to extract uh, what we considered kind of key themes and key points. So here is the kind of list of, of companies that we, we focused on uh, to the left. So you see we focus on Deliveroo, b and British Airways, Superdrug, and this is over a number of years, uh, some of these incidents, um, National Lottery, Deloitte, Hotpoint UK, and so on. And then to the right, we have our expert commentators. So these are the people that actually commented and, and kind of wrote up some, in some instances very substantial reflections on each of the breaches that had occurred. So you have, as I mentioned, Schneider on security, Krebs on security, Troy Hunt, Graham Cluley, Chris Vickery, We Live Security. So a number of kind of big names that hopefully wouldn't surprise any of you in the context of that they report on security and they write up some pretty comprehensive and they're, they're pretty relatively good in their, in their kind of nature of how they reflect on the incidents and what has occurred and what hasn't occurred. So then, we, of course, the next step was to once again identify themes. So from our perspective, the themes that were identified relate to a lot of, in, a lot of commentators focus on kind of credibility of statement. And what I mean there is for some businesses, when, they, when an incident occurred, they released a statement. But then when commentators reflected on the statement, either the statement did it seem true, uh, it seemed false, it seemed to have too many holes, it seemed to be inconsistent. And a lot of commentators really kind of focused and said, hey, these companies, there's something fishy going on here. These companies are not either being upfront they're not being truthful, there's something else going on here. So a lot of companies question the credibility of the statement released by a fair amount of the, the organizations. Um, yeah, the organizations after a breach. Another big point was downplaying. So what you saw was that some, some organizations, they had a breach and then what they did was they basically said, they released a statement saying, oh, um, yes, the breach has occurred, but you know what, it's, it's not so bad. You know, we have 100,000, 100 million customers only, 1 million were impacted. So yeah, it's bad, but it's not that bad. You know, commentators were, um, not commentators, organizations were heavily criticized uh, by commentators when they mentioned um, that as a, when they mentioned that as, a, as an issue. Then you have kind of this idea of focus on customer. Um, so therefore, um, the point being that some organizations, um, it was made very clear that they were actually focused on the customer, which was great. But some organizations, it wasn't, and it wasn't really clear what they were doing. It almost seemed they were just trying to cover their backs. So that wasn't an ideal situation. Um, and then we also see some uh, many instances, actually, this kind of not disclosing or delaying. As I, sh as I mentioned to you earlier in the talk, there was actually a number of instances where, um, you know, TravelX or, or a few others 
where they waited quite a long time to actually disclose to the public that this incident had occurred and that they had been impacted. And then probably another big one being this idea of admission of responsibility uh, and whether it is correct to admit responsibility or, excuse me, or whether organizations shouldn't admit responsibility. And from a commentator perspective, commentators were saying for organizations, they should step up and they should accept responsibility for the breach, whereas some organizations were kind of trying to offload responsibility onto other parties. So there's a little bit of tension there that you could clearly tell was, was something that might be of interest to focus on. So then here's a number of kind of the, or an example of the best practices that were extracted. So we see kind of this point about being prepared, which shouldn't be a massive surprise, um, but probably one of the big ones being accepting responsibility. So commentators really believe that companies should accept responsibility and not blame others and not kind of try to offload the blame on, on someone else, even if, even if others were, were, were the attackers. And I'll come on to that a bit later when I actually discuss the nature of the framework. Uh, and then there's this point about kind of um, looking at trying to ensure that customers were minimally, minimally impacted. So actually, if the breach occurred, that trying to put things in place so customers were minimally impacted, as many minimally impacted as possible, so that it's not a case of data was lost and then that data is now being used to exploit customers and so on and so forth. The point is that organizations should step in and if data was lost, to put things in place immediately to ensure there's no follow on impact on whether it's customers, um, supply chain partners, and so on. And then lastly, there can this point about kind of sooner rather than later. This was highly debatable and I, I can fully appreciate. I've engaged with a number of companies who have made it clear that this point about communicating publicly is really debatable. But from at least from the expert side, they believe that communicating sooner rather than later was what companies should try to do. So then, of course, the point is we have these two sets of best practices. The question is, well, what do we do now? What do we do next? Um, so literature, what we did was basically we took the two lists and we tried to compare and contrast what was being suggested. In some situations, what we had was things actually lining up really well, uh, and that was great because we could sort of combine those and try to extract a best practice from that. In some of the situations, we have things not lining up, but, but then being quite complementary, so you can actually use um, both of the recommendations, um, so there's no conflict per se. And then, but of course, you're always going to have some situations where their conflicts and one one so for example from the the academic side one thing that came up one thing that was really put, being pushed by some uh, some group of academics was that attack um that organization should actually offload blame to the attackers because the reality is that the organization is a victim just like anyone else and therefore they should offload blame to the attacker and they should not um say oh well it's my fault you know i'm really sorry um, whereas from the comment comments uh, commentator perspective, they were very clear that, you know, companies should accept responsibility and avoid blaming attackers, hackers, business partners, and so on. And in situations like this, where we had this kind of, um, this conflict, this disagreement, what we did was we reflected on the data again, and we basically made a judgment call in terms of what had the strongest argument and what would probably be the most complementary to, to the framework that we were trying to produce. And in this situation, we went with accepting responsibility as an example, but I'll come on to that a bit further, a bit later on. So that work and kind of moving from the best practices led to roughly something like this that you see on screen. And this is essentially kind of framework or playbook version one, where we have kind of two main areas before and after crisis, before an incident occurs, and kind of the, the cyber crisis response after incident occurs. And we have, we brought not only to a number of different boxes, a number of different kind of uh, workflows. But of course, the key question, which I'm sure we would have gotten if we had submitted the, the, the article there, well, is, well, yeah, this is interesting, but there's no validation at all. You know, this is just an idea, but all these ideas might be useless. They might miss the mark completely. So what we did was we actually paused there reflected a bit and then we went out and we said okay well you know what let's try to evaluate what we're doing here let's try to evaluate what we're proposing I we reached out to a number of different um we did kind of a very selective sample we tried to reach out to a number of different people who we felt would actually be the ones that would actually respond be, be responsible for engaging in discussions about what organizations should do in such situations so on screen you see kind of we, we reached out to 13 participants um and what we did was with these 13 participants we looked at 
um, we try to recruit them. We try to focus specifically on individuals who um, were quite senior, as you can see, based on the year's experience. That although you can see also, and I'm, I'm very much in the kind of C-suite level. So we looked at chief risk officers. We looked, got a number of, we got some CIOs, got some CISOs, heads of cybersecurity, um, some directors, and so on. And we got company, we got individuals from not only the cyber, um, cyber and information space in organizations, but we also reached out to individuals who were focused very much on crisis response. Because of course, in many ways, you might consider this, uh, especially a significant cyber attack as a crisis. You know, there's lots of going on, you need to find out what to do, you need to find out what to do quite quickly. And we so we felt it's better to engage with some individuals from there as well. And you can see based on the organizations, there are some quite large organizations that we engage with. And that sort of led to this framework, which you can see on the screen, which is the framework we have in the paper, uh, and a slightly more pretty version, which is the one I'll show you now, which we which we did we use as the independent nature for the context of the white paper. So this is what I'm going to go through with you now um, in a bit of a little bit of detail. Uh, so what I'm going to do is talk through some of the key areas of the framework uh, and how, generally speaking, we envisage it working. And then we, of course, we can move on to, to questions, any questions that anyone uh, has afterwards at the end of the talk. So we break down the framework into the, even the refined framework kind of version two um, uh, into two parts. Once again, we have the pre-event and we have the kind of after, after crisis occurs. And we've also identified a number of kind of things which we call kind of points to consider and points of guidance. So consider is things that the company should consider doing and guidance or the kind of more nudges towards you should do this. So on screen, let's look at pre-event um, first. So on pre-event, we have things to consider, like the left side of the screen first, which is, so we have things like the company needs to first establish and prioritize uh, uh, event aims. So what do they care about if a breach occurs? What do they, what's most important to them? Is it money imagine damage to their reputation? Is it their stock market value? Is it legal obligations? And of course, this will depend a lot on what type of organization it is. If it's an organization that is, you know, they live and breathe data, versus being like a manufacturing organization, that, that needs to factor into this decision. Then we of course have things like determining security gaps to inform um, communications response. The, the essence of that, the, their, that point actually is to nudge organizations to think more carefully about things like encryption. To think about almost and prepare themselves for a breach occurring and to think what things do they need to have in place in situations if a breach actually occurs. On the right hand side, you see kind of this point about guidance. And what we try to do here is actually to nudge organizations towards getting well prepared. So for instance, agreeing kind of decision makers of cross-functional crisis teams. What was extremely surprising actually, even in the talks of them after we published this work, is that a number of organizations still do not have cross-functional or cross-institutional uh, cross or cross-organizational um, response teams when it comes to data breaches. It's still often, the people in the IT department, the people in the security department, uh, and potentially, the, of course, the, the people in the legal department, uh, and generally speaking, that's it. We still don't see kind of engagement with people in marketing, in PR, in, in different things like that. And those we believe, are, of course, and, and various other teams uh, need to be kind of looped in. Um, also kind of cherry picking, you know, things like uh, jurisdictions and trying to identify what jurisdictions the company is working with uh, what are the actual kind of disclosure benchmarks in those jurisdictions? What are the class action risks and so on? Especially if you're looking at if you have or if you have um, uh, customers in the US, and then other things such as kind of trying to have kind of drafts of of emails, drafts of crisis response needed, um, templates needed in terms of if something happens, if you need to actually have a response, a holding response, um, kind of immediately you should have drafts ready as opposed to only having to think about, okay, what should we say, how should we say? All this preparatory stuff needs to happen uh, beforehand, even things like activating a website, knowing what website, knowing what domain, knowing what FAQs, knowing what hotlines, all this stuff really needs to be in place beforehand. Then if we look on the right side, then this focuses more on kind of um, looking at the partners that organizations have. All organizations today are heavily intertwined in some supply chain or the next. So it's really trying to be aware of who your supply chain partners are, how should they be notified, whether you should actually involve them in rehearsals, in plans, in business continuity planning, in major incident responses and rehearsals. And this is also really, really important as, as you think about the context of a breach, 
I mean, some of you might uh, remember the Blackboard uh, breach, which actually impacted, um, they, they, they were impacted, but the number of universities and other institutions that were impacted as a result of that, you know, is also really interesting. So stuff like that, that organization needs to think more carefully about. Um, and then of course, key, involving key decision makers and also having the idea of walkthroughs, realistic scenarios and playing, playing those through. Then after kind of, so assuming that you set that up well, before a breach occurs, the next thing to think about is, well, after a breach occurs, or and I'm, here we're kind of viewing there's kind of two points. There's before and there's after. So it's not necessarily immediately after, but it's just, it's just after. Um, so after a breach occurs, one question, of course, is that you might be, you know, that will fit, Bill will be faced with is, you know, is, you know, they might be thinking, okay, a breach has occurred. What do we start to do? What do we need to think about? So the first question we have here is deciding whether to disclose. Now, of course, this is a highly debatable thing. And some of you might say, well, of course you need to disclose. Well, actually it's not really um, that clear cut, but, but bear with me a second. So the way how we try to kind of advise on this is to highlight, well, firstly, is disclosure mandatory? And that depends on who is impacted, is the data encrypted, uh, are the industry specific rules and all that, or if you remember, is the stuff I just mentioned that organizations need to keep um, keep mindful of or, or keep kind of about what we call a knowledge database about uh, from the previous stage. So the point is if a breach occurs, then it can dip in quite quickly. They can find out what the situation is for those that have been impacted and what is the state of the data that has potentially been impacted. Now, in some situations, um, they might be a yes, disclosure is mandatory. We need to tell people, okay, how do we go about telling them? In some of the situations, it might be no, either all the data is encrypted or the data, the, the locations maybe are not relevant. Um, and then we still have this point about, well, yes, maybe you don't have to tell people, but should you tell them anyway? Should you disclose anyway? You know, there's questions we have here, probably a bit, a bit kind of philosophical. Is it the right thing to do? Um, which, you know, you know, I, I'm aware it's business, but still is the right thing to do. Um, is there a risk of the, I mean, one key thing here is, is there a risk of the data appearing on the dark web later? So we've seen some instances of this, which is why we took this uh, approach. We've also seen some, some instances actually of organizations not disclosing, and then a whistleblower actually disclosing a few months later. And then it looks significantly worse. Um, and the media tends to run with it significantly worse because it almost is a breach occurred the organization kept it quiet and now this whistleblower has to come out and blow the lid on it and the, the organization's reputation and perceptions in it, to stakeholders to the media to the public looks really quite bad which is why we kind of say you know maybe still consider um if you want to disclose anyway so let's assume that the organization decides to disclose the key question then is well what to disclose what should be said and that is probably should, that needs to be guided by what are the regulatory requirements, um, what are the kind of data, who are the data subjects that have been impacted, what data has been lost, and then of course like one of the key questions that always come back is what's the side of the breach. And one thing we say here is avoid underestimating the breach. And why we say this is, so we we looked at a number of cases, and there were some uh, media cases in particular where a organization got breached. They said, let's say, ten thousand records have been lost. And then when they do some more digging, they find out, oh, it's actually 50,000 or it's 100,000. And when they say 10,000 has been lost, the media tends to run with it as a story and everyone kind of blows it up and kind of highlights um, the, the, the impact of this breach. And basically the organization's reputation takes a bit of a hit. And they can even take a bit of a hit in the stock market if they're publicly traded. And then if they have to kind of restate and kind of say, well, it's not, well, actually it was not 100, Hundred thousand. It was ten hundred. It was a hundred. Sorry, it was not uh, ten thousand. I mean, it was a hundred thousand. Then once again, actually, media tends to run with that story again, and basically, organization takes another big hit, which is why we think we kind of highlight this point of potentially avoid underestimating. Of course, there's a question about overestimating, but we'll come back to that um, in a bit. Then there's a question about frame the message. So how should you, the organization frame the message? How should they say what they need to say? And here we have kind of key guidance, one being accept responsibility. Uh, and the way we say that, oops, the way we say that, the reason we say that is because often the perception from customers is customers give you, people give you, businesses give you as the organization their data and they expect you to protect it. Think of it, if it were you, if you give an organization your data, you expect them to protect it. So the key thing that, that we kind of advise here is apologize. So accept responsibility. 
um, even if it's a stakeholder's fault and even if there's some, uh, some kind of uh, interaction there, but accept responsibility. Avoid downplaying. We found that downplaying a breach really makes it seem that you're not taking it seriously and it really annoys people in the media, it annoys shareholders, it annoys the public. Also kind of address feelings of vulnerability because um, we saw a number of cases where organizations just simply said, oh, well, here's credit monitoring. No, data breaches actually impact more than that. And then lastly, avoid blaming others. And that's interesting because uh, we've seen a number of instances where people try to blame supply chain partners and then it result in kind of big uh, public disagreements and quite dirty disagreements as well, all played in the public space and in the media space. On the right hand side, we kind of have kind of key things about kind of aggregate, aggregating factors. So things that actually might aggravate the breach. And especially if a organization has had a breach before, you know, then going out and saying, oh, we take security seriously. Well, how can you take security seriously if you had a breach six months ago? Uh, are you having another one now? And then even other things, just taking into account age, gender, cultural differences. We see, still see a lot of the messaging just focus almost on one demographic and not considering the nature that often um, data breaches um, impact a wide demographic of individuals and therefore the messages need to be a bit more customized. Now in terms of um, choosing when to disclose, um, we highlight here to maybe nudge more towards uh, disclosing quicker, um, so as quickly as possible. The key reason we have, and we know this is a kind of highly debated point, the reason why we say this is because it helps address feelings of vulnerability to, to those that have been impacted, to the subject that have been impacted. And it also can sometimes help to frame public opinion in terms of if you almost kind of get ahead of this mess, potentially, it might actually do you better in the long run than actually kind of keeping quiet, letting rumors spread, letting kind of your the, the organization's image, brand and so on get dragged through the mud and the organization not offering any comment on what's going on or why it's, why it's happening. And we saw a number of instances for this. Um, of course, we fully appreciate there's a balance between accuracy and timing. Uh, so that also needs to be considered. And then on the other side, thinking about how to disclose, I think this is one of the more interesting one, much more interesting parts as well, in that we've seen a number of organizations actually focusing on disclosing on social media. Uh, but as we saw from the earlier example, uh, when this post, when this post occurs, sometimes people can actually um, what this can result in actually, especially Twitter is a good example result in kind of a Twitter storm in that the organization can be bombarded with quite negative messages quite quickly. So there's questions is around, you know, should the organization maybe have a bit more of a direct approach, for example, using email addresses, uh, Surface Mail came out as a potential suggestion. But what was interesting here, there was, you know, some people actually complained and said, well, Surface Mail could be good. But the reality is that a number of people actually would be quite annoyed if they're receiving Surface Mail because it's actually quite damaging to the environment, for example. And then um, websites, telephone, um, I think all these things come up as well. Traditional media also was interesting, but I think one of the key, key points here is the, the approach that's used, whether it's indirect, whether which, whichever specific approach you're going to use, needs to be dependent quite a bit on who are the demographic, who are the, who are the individuals that have been impacted by this breach and how does it impact them. And so, for example, if you have a much younger demographic, maybe social media works, maybe social media and email, if you have an older demographic, potentially traditional media uh, and a website, you know, it, it really all depends on what the demographic is. But what we would like to see and what we haven't seen so far is a bit more customized approaches uh, depending on who, who has been impacted by, by the breaches. And then kind of the last slide here is, um, so this is focused more on kind of validating and sorry, not validating, let me say, uh, it's focusing more on preparing for reaction. And here this focuses on somewhat, you might consider it somewhat simple things such as briefing, briefing staff, briefing staff. But what, what was interesting here or what was key here, we found that a number of instances, staff weren't briefed about the breach. Staff tended to find out once the information went public. And this actually really annoyed staff, but it still actually occurs quite, quite, um, quite often. Um, and then of course, trying to scale up response. You need to have the number of instances as well, and it's, it's just so, so, so surprising. Number of instances where our existing loss um, announces a breach, and then the call centers are overwhelmed and no one can get through. And all we can hear uh, publicly said on their websites is, um, you know, I'm sorry, we're sorry, we're currently experiencing a high volume of calls. But, you know, th they should ex uh, appreciate that and expect that to happen and scale up their services to suit. Um, delivering the message is also kind of a really interesting one as well. And this is about how do you deliver the message? Once you have the message there, you have the message framed. How do you deliver it? 
if you look back to the talk talk uh, scenario from the beginning of, of this, this uh, seminar, um, you can see that the CEO was kind of the main one delivering the message. Uh, if we look at the, I mean, British Airways, I think we saw the same thing, but for a number of other organizations, we haven't seen that. So what we are suggesting here is that um, a pretty senior person, especially depending on the size of the breach, these to deliver the message, and this helps actually frame it and highlight that this breach is being taken seriously and not that this is just another breach and you know we're not really taking it seriously. Also avoiding jargon, keeping things simple. The reality is that most people um, aren't, well, the, the, you know, the reality is that no one probably is gonna, or most people won't be security specialists. They won't understand what's being said, but it's really important to be clear what's being said and how it's being said and why it's being said like that. And of course, oh, sorry, the last one, because we've seen a number of scenarios here as well, you know, being very clear about doing the training, having a good spokesperson that can actually engage with the media and not kind of trip over themselves. So, I mean, that was kind of the framework in kind of, uh, uh, kind of a quick, a quick, uh, quick overview of the framework. Um, but the last thing I wanted to mention before, before we kind of move on to questions is um, the fact that the, I think the framework has had a lot of good um, engagement since it's been released. So a few weeks after it was released, um, the register, which some of you might know, uh, covered it uh, in terms of it basically wrote it into and, and helped nudge it to be a guide that, that uh, businesses could use to help them determine how to respond. Um, Infosec Security um, has also did, uh, did also did a, a piece on it. So they interviewed me for it and kind of nudging companies and providing this baseline for companies and how they should respond. I did a talk for IEEE, uh, UK and Ireland section. Uh, I spoke at Sophos Evolve. I spoke at SASIG, if you know what SASIG Security Awareness Group. And then also I submitted um, a summary of the work, well, not a summary really, I submitted a poster of the based on the work to NDSS, because of course they allow you to submit posters based on previous work. And that won uh, a best poster award um, earlier this year, in February this year. So that's sort of it. Thank you very, very much for listening and thank you for coming along. Um, and yeah, check out the framework. Well, thank you very much, Jason. This was a brilliant talk. Uh, I do have some questions, but I'll first open it to the floor, uh, check if someone else has questions to ask. So if anybody has questions, if you could please raise your Zoom hand. Okay. So uh, I, I, my, my first question would be, uh, I mean, if, if you think about the transition from the physical world to the digital, uh, we, we do have breaches in the physical world, right? How, I mean, are we in any state to compare the incident responses in, in a physical world? Say for example, if there's, if there's a breach in the bank, some people breach, I mean, go, go into the bank, breaches the bank's physical security, steals money. Do, do we have any kind of comparison? Do we, can we even compare these two kinds of scenarios? Um, my probably initial response would be maybe, but I'm not sure how, how we would in terms of breach response. I mean, what, one thing that I would probably say in the context of um, breach response, at least from a cyber perspective, um, re well, not recently, but probably from what I've seen in general, is that there's been a massive focus on uh, technical response. And, and so for example, there, I mean, there's an infinite number of publications that focus on here is how you should respond from a technical perspective after a breach, here is the incident response that you need to put in place. Um, here is various different things that you need to do, but there's very little on what should companies say after a breach occurs? And I think that's the sort of angle that I, I we're trying to come from from this work. Um, you know, trying to identify not only to think about well, here is the technical side of things, here is the digital forensics and so on, but also to think about what needs to be done almost from a social technical perspective. And that's the sort of angle that this research tries to come from and tries to nudge organizations and and, and academics to think about actually, because I mean, you raise an interesting point about the physical versus the cyber. Uh, I think we're definitely better off in the physical space, but I think there's a lot that more that can be done in cyber um, on this space. Sure. I think there's another question in the chat. Is that correct? Oh. Or, I mean, or that has that person oh, left? Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So Roberto has a question. Roberto, would you want to unmute yourself and ask? Uh, okay, uh, not sure if, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just read out the question then. Uh, so how time robust uh, would you evaluate this framework? For example, uh, you expect it to be changed significantly every year, five years? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's a good question. Um, and the, I think the reality is um, that, I think the reality is that it's impossible to know um, cyber is such a tricky um, domain. Things can change so quickly. I think from what we've seen based on the framework now, it probably, uh, from what we can tell actually, it probably, it works for now. Whether it'll work next year or in five years, I don't know, but I don't think I would find, I don't think I've seen any evidence to say over time, it will become less relevant or less of an issue. Um, I do think and hope that, and one of the reasons I, so I did this work, one, because I was really interested in the topic, but also two, because um, I really think that academics, especially cyber academics, need to focus a bit more on the social technical security side. Um, and even this bit of work, I think that this in itself can nudge academics more towards thinking about the social technical uh, security problems um, that, that need to probably focus, uh, that we need to focus on a bit more. But generally speaking, I can't see any part of the framework that would radically change. Um, even if we think about things like, I don't know, accepting responsibility after a breach, that that is one that I think is is quite robust and can stand the test of time. Of course, others, if there's some new medium of interaction that occurs, um, that might also have an impact on, for example, the medium at which organizations um, speak to customers. Okay. Or, okay. Or, other, or other businesses. Thanks. Thanks for the answer, Jason. Uh, we have Roy. Roy has a question. Uh, may I request Roy to... Oh, hi, Jason. Hey, Roy. Um, thanks for a nice talk. I'm reminded of the old saying, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. And uh, in some sense, it seems to me that when uh, when a company reports something, maybe that report ought to be measured for, you know, let's just say some kind of quality attributes measured against the criteria that you've uh, talked about today. So um, one could imagine. Uh, a publication about some breach where there is a chart, you know, or, ex or an example, right, that follows your criteria. And next to it is another chart that shows how the current company's breach did with respect to the guidance that you would offer, right? So this then puts a company in, a, in the position where they either look like fools or they, in some sense, come clean, right? So, I mean, I, you, you, early in your talk, you had a slide that showed a, a number of uh, companies that have had breaches. And I, I personally have been a victim in three of those, okay? So I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty annoyed with all, all the stuff that happened to me, including um, having, a, having a credit card canceled the day before a flight to London, uh, where I needed that credit card to get my train ticket. So uh, yeah, the way the whole thing was handled was, was actually pretty bad. That was British Air, incidentally. And, uh, but my point here is that, you know, to, to encourage companies to do the right kind of reporting by, in some sense, systematically measuring how well they actually do against some set of criteria like the ones that you have proposed. Yeah, th thanks, Roy. I think that's uh, that's a really, really good point. And that's kind of one of the things that we're, we're aiming to do in, in some future work that follows on from this. Because you're completely right in that measurement is, is quite important. And being able to track these things is, is quite important. 
And going back to the data that we have and reflecting on it in the context of the framework would, would somewhat be ideal. And one thing that we're also trying to do is actually to look forward a bit and to try to see, um, of course, it's impossible to, to be sure, but, but try to see if an organization that's breached, especially recently, had adopted the things that we had said, do we think that things might have gone a bit better from their perspective? But you're completely right in that the, the way in which organizations have traditionally handled um, breach response, especially when it comes to engage with customers, has been generally just not, not, not really great. Um, and I think part of that is just because there has been more of a focus towards the more technical level of response. And then, you know, somewhere along the line, we see a CEO coming out uh, and doing a video or, or going on radio or, or whatever and, and releasing a or, or in the media or in the news, or you see a Twitter post or Facebook post uh, about the breach occurring. But I think the reality is that we need to see organizations doing much more than that and, and engaging much better. And I think part of that is actually be, uh, considering this fact that it's just it's not only if a breach will occur it's potentially when it occurs and if we can to get to really start pushing our users to think about that and think about these other things i'm hoping that we can actually have a better baseline um yeah better baseline yeah of but course yeah. i i always like to to ask you know what what is the core problem right what is the problem really at the foundation of whatever it is that one wants to talk about. And in this particular case, uh, especially with regard to airlines, right, which I have yeah. an unfortunate familiarity with, um, the, the, the corporate uh, focus is on profits, not on people, mm -hmm. right? So in some sense, it's no surprise that they bungle uh, the breach because they were they, they, their focus is on profit and on money, not on customers, until it becomes an embarrassment, right? And then they say, well, hey, you know, let's spend a couple of hours talking to the customers and make them feel good, and then we'll just go right back to our old practices. So they need to be held accountable somehow, right? And if they either measure up or don't measure up to criteria like you have, that would be one way to hold them accountable. Yeah, that's a really good point. Definitely, definitely take it on board. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Roy, and thanks, Jason. Uh, Bri has a question. Bri, uh, would would you like uh, to? Sorry, yeah, I, I didn't use it. Um, yeah, I just wonder if you, when you, sorry, let's turn on my camera for as well. Um, if you encountered some uh, trust issues or resistance to notification among these companies, whether they kind of uh, thought it might actually be a scam attempt uh, or they just gladly take any notification. Do you see any um, data or evidence suggesting one way or another? It, so just to confirm, thanks, Budi, for the question. Do you, do you mean um, companies wanting to notify or from the, the, the company side or the people side? I think that's where I'm a little bit confused with your question. So, the, so when the company, uh, I guess in this case, companies receive notification saying that, there's potentially a uh, vulnerability in your system or risk that. No, so it's probably more the other side in that. So the, the, the angle that we're taking here with this work is if a company gets breached, a company has to notify. So, oh, so if we use Roy's example, for example, if we use Roy's example, you know, if an airline is breached, the airline has mm -hmm. a person's data. Um, the airline in, in some situations or hopefully in most situations should be notifying that yeah. person that their data has been lost or exposed. And often what happens is that, that the airline also maybe posts something online mm -hmm. or it basically gets released or they post it in the news. Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, how does, an, or how does that airline engage with the media? Mm -hmm. How does that airline engage with their customers? Does that, does that airline write you an email do they phone you do they text you how do they engage with you and, and what do they do um, yeah. that's what i think that's the angle go ahead thanks for the clarification on that so in that case when a customer received this do you see that they're actually trusting the notification from the company so they be like hang on this sounds a bit dodgy 
I think in most situations, from from what we've seen in the work, it, they they usually trust it because they basically try to check. But of course, the, there are situations where you know these will be phishing emails and so on. But in most scenarios, what we've seen is that most organizations usually adopt <clears throat> um, a multi-tiered approach where they might. Um, so I mean, I'll use airline for example. They might release a video online um, where they're actually talking about the breach and trying to explain it. And they'll, what will happen is almost certainly, you know, the BBC, Register, and other news organizations will hear about the breach and they'll immediately contact the organization to try to get a comment. And then they'll release, a, and then these are BBC and so on will release a story. So all these people have perspectives on the breach that occurred, whether the response was good or bad. So there was a really interesting article, um, I think, published by, um, yeah, Krebs on Security that, that reflected on the Equifax breach. Um, and the things that went right and the things that went wrong. So it's that kind of side of things that we're trying to understand, but especially not only from, I should say, not only from kind of the technical side, but also the source of technical side. Okay, See uh, thanks. See you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. thanks, thanks, Buddy. Thanks, Jason. I think uh, Tai has a question after this. Uh, yes, um, so my question is, are there any evidence that uh, not following the best practice will lead to bad consequences or negative consequences? Yeah, good question. Um, so yes, there's there's a fair amount of evidence. Um, what we've seen, I mean, depending on what what's your metric, um, for some for, for some instances, we've seen, for example, stock price be quite significantly impacted. Um, so a breach occurs and stock price uh, gets hit quite hard. If we look at um, Let's look at the TravelX breach, actually. So the TravelX breach, which happened late 2019, if I remember correctly, hey, late 2019 or early, early 2020, um, they got the hit by ransomware, right? Um, they didn't say anything to anyone for quite a period of time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they released it publicly that their systems were down and so on. But what happened is that in the period of time where they weren't saying anything, a lot of news outlets were running stories saying, hey, something's going on here, what's going on? And this actually resulted in people probably trying to shun TravelX a bit in terms of, well, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna order money, I'm not gonna order it from them because they clearly have an issue. Um, and that of course kind of can, can continue to spin and result in kind of further fallout for them. And what in the end, what happened, which they, they seemed to go into administration for a while and then they were saved, but with TravelX in particular, a combination of the ransomware attack, which had their systems offline uh, for a long period of time and resulted in reputational damage, which of course, once again, perpetuated the issue. And then secondly, the COVID pandemic, that resulted in them actually kind of going, almost going out of business uh, for a while, which thankfully they were saved in the end. Well, thank you for them, they were saved in the end. But I think that's one example. Another quick example is, I think it is Ticketmaster. So Ticketmaster got breached and uh, what they had, I believe what they had said in their breach, what they had said was um, the, their breach was in part, their perspective of their breach was in part due to um, some code given by a third party that they were working with. And they said, well, you know, yes, the breach occurred, but you know what, I think there's this third party that also, that also maybe should share some of the blame or something. The third party then publicly responded and said, they said this publicly, the third party then publicly responded and said, hey, that's not true. If they had told us that they were going to do this in this way, we'd have told them they should not have done that. And then you kind of run, had, had this really public, messy disagreement about what should have really been handled more tactfully and kind of internally of respect, with respect to communication. And Equifax is another one. So there's been, time, there's been a fair amount of evidence of kind of lots of follow actually um, with kind of poor communications. Okay. So, so I guess one thing is really in this situation or post uh, incidents, right? The, the main thing the companies probably want to do is to somehow lower the attention to the, to the events, right? Exactly. Once people don't care about this or they, the, the media lost interest in this, then they are safe, all right? Yeah. So, so, so that's, I guess, is the, is the main objective for the company, all right? And then, yeah. What they do may follow the best practice you, you just suggested, or may not, depends on the situation. Yeah, I think the, the, 
Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, there might be some under table actions which we don't know actually <laughs> no and, and uh, yes there, there always is and probably one thing i'll say, may, mention actually based on that point about the kind of on the table actions is in a number of breaches where uh, and i'm well aware of this a number of breaches where organizations haven't said anything publicly um so you know a breach occurs they know it's occurred and they haven't said anything for weeks and uh, sometimes one it's because their legal team has said don't say anything the mm -hmm. internal legal team. Two, it's because they're working with the police and the police has said, don't say anything publicly because we want to manage this carefully. Um, so, so that also can be can be considered. And then three, uh, some of you might be aware, uh, you might be aware of something called cyber insurance, which is, uh, I wouldn't say new, but it's, it's gaining in popularity constantly. The cyber insurance provider might also say, don't say anything publicly. So there's all types of stuff happening that actually puts pressure on companies from all, all directions. But you're completely right in that is it's almost their vested interest for a breach to occur, no one find out about it and no one do anything or the media just runs with it once and no one runs with it again. But I think one of the realities is that, uh, while that's the ideal, um, I think there is a really strong argument for getting in front of the situation uh, quicker and just trying to have a handle on it and not let it get away from you. I've even seen it some, some organizations who have hit breaches. And then what happens later is that um, a, a whistleblower uh, fight highlights it. Or some of us might remember, you might remember the Uber breach, which I can't remember a few years back, but Uber had a breach. Um, they paid off the attackers, the hackers. And then years later, it became all public that they had a breach and they paid off attackers. And then that, that, that completely blew up and you know, that didn't do their reputation any good. And I think, I can't remember if they got fined at the end by the ICO. So all that stuff needs to be considered in terms of their breaches. And this, which is why I think with this framework, the point is try to get in front of it as quickly as possible, which allows you to manage it and handle it better. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Tai, Tai has a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tai, are you there? So I'll, I'll probably read it out. So how easy is it for the framework to be applied across different sectors, including the HEMs? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so great question, Tai. Um, so I think um, there's clearly scope for it to be to be applied. Um, I think the point at this at this point in time is to use this as a, a stepping stone and first you to see um, whether there are similarities, whether there are differences to the HEI sector, whether there are unique differences to the HEI sector, which might make it not applicable. But I think this could be a basis to which you then you can re you can then reflect and, and think about can it be played, or if there are any reasons or any kind of adaptations in the framework which might be necessary for it to actually suit HEI. Um, I mean, the reality is that it has been designed using um, more industry-focused sectors, and some I think some from charity as well, but I, I would probably say kind of this could be used as a basis and then any if there are any adaptations that are necessary for HEI, that's probably the, the way to, to look at this. Okay, uh, thanks Jason. I don't see any other question here, but I do have one last question, quick one. So uh, say a company would want to set up an incident response team and uh, somebody who will head the team. So what kind of skill sets uh, should they be looking for? Should they be looking for people who understand uh, breaches very well, like uh, data breaches very well, or sh should they be people with uh, med good media links or, or managerial skills? Well, I mean, the, the probably the great question, I think the reality is that um, it's really all about cross-functional teams. And I think, I think any, you know, any leader will work once they're a leader and they really understand that, um, you know, leading is also, you need to consider who, you, you need to consider the reality that leading doesn't always mean that your opinion is the opinion and everyone should just do what you say. It's about, and if we go back to one of the initial points that I mentioned about cross, cross organizational teams, when it comes to incident response, even more generally, or in terms of communications um, in particular, you know, part of the reality is that it's necessary to have these kind of cross institutional incident response teams that can plug in, that can jump in, um, the reality is that cyber impacts, cybersecurity, computer security impacts all, all functions and facets of society now and organizations. And it's really all about, 
all about or important to engage with others get the lawyers in the room get the you have to be have to have people with some marketing experience in the room or kind of public communications or corporate communications experience you have to um, probably get definitely almost certainly your hr team of course the security the it teams but we i think we need to start stop thinking about cyber as more tech as as only technical uh, and kind of consider the socio technical nature of it and i think that's probably probably what i would suggest Okay. Of course, I'm okay. biased. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jason. Thanks, everybody, Thanks lot, who joined this uh, UKSPS seminar for today. Uh, we'll have, uh, of course, I mean, we have these seminars every week, uh, every Wednesday from 3 to 4 UK time. So please, please uh, join every week. And, and see you, everybody. Have a very nice day. And thanks again, Jason, for the talk. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.